Okay, today on the podcast, I am joined by a man who's well versed in the music industry from the band's Trickster and from the band's Fozzy and his own personal solo stuff, Mr. PJ Farley. How are you, sir? Thanks for coming on eventually. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. No problem. I suppose the first question is like that I always ask people that are musicians is how did you get into music? What's your first memories of hearing a band or hearing a song that said, right, I want to do this? Um, Kiss, pretty much. And that old story, you know, Kiss came along and it was like, that's, that's what I want to do. And you can still see it in your in what you're doing in the quarantine band these days as well with Kiss as well with the covers. Lifer, yep. And what was the first instrument that you ever got? Uh, drums. I was a drummer. I'm oh. a drummer at heart. It's the first thing I I wanted to play. I loved the drums, um, but I grew up in like a small two bedroom apartment, so having a drum set got pretty noisy after a while. So. I had to give them up, and um, you know, I actually by default I started playing bass because okay. I, was, I was playing drums. And when I went to go start a band, all my friends either played drums or guitar, and nobody wanted to play bass. So I'm like, all right, fuck it, I'll play bass. There's always a shortage of bassists when you're trying to form a band. We had that problem. I had a band years and years ago, and we couldn't find a bassist, and we were doing a a battle of the bands here in Ireland and we had to do it without a bassist. It was a bad idea. <laughs> See, you only miss us when we're not there. Yeah, the first thing they said was, right, battle of the bands, no bassist. Okay, <laughs> you, you you, guys are not going through. Tell that to the White Stripes. <laughs> I suppose, yeah, fairness. In terms of Trickster then and the formation of that band, in the lead up to that, like, were you in many other different bands? Was that your first big band? Um, well, yeah. I mean, I was, I think I was still 14 when I joined Trickster. Yeah. Um, but I was in two bands before that. Um, and that's how I kind of met Trickster because I was playing the same clubs as them when I was, you know, 13 or 14. And right around the time I was just 15, maybe, maybe I think it, maybe I was just 15 when I joined Trickster then. And did you ever did you ever see it coming to a point where you'd be supporting Kiss? In my head, yes. <laughs> that was cocky little shit. And how, how many how many gigs did you open for that, those guys? How how many did we do with Kiss? Yeah, uh, we did about two and a half months. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The whole uh, the Revenge tour. So it was. October 1st through middle middle of December. And was that all in America or was there anywhere else? Uh, some Canada. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was that experience like? Uh, that was, you know, for for Steve and I, Steve, the guitar player and trickster, and I, Kiss was, you know, the be all end all. So when we got that Kiss tour, you know, that was just like, that's as kids, that being our first musical you know, they were our first musical heroes. So, you know, uh, that was just a huge mark in our career. So every day out on that tour, was like going into the arena and seeing the Kiss Road case and, you know, like, shit, you know, that's cool. I mean, that's surreal. And what were the guys like? I'm, I'm assuming you've, like, were chatting to them and bumped into them as you were going on. Like, what were they like as... I suppose as people, um, yeah, the ones that would talk uh, were great. <laughs> okay, Gene was great. First, first and foremost, Gene was always in our dress. Gene and Eric were in our dressing room all the time. Yeah. Um, Paul was pretty much to himself. He would, you know, give us a wave. You know, not really say too much. You know, that's him. Uh, and uh, Bruce is, you know, always great. You know, whenever we saw him, he didn't really hang out too much. But Gene would come out with us on nights off. And, you know, <clears throat> again, I mean, Gene would walk in and Eric would be in our dressing room every night. <laughs> Must have been a, a surreal experience. Yeah, definitely yeah. was. And in terms of yourself then, like I know from looking at John Line, you do a lot of solo stuff as well. 
Like, yeah. what's your what's your own personal influences getting into music apart from Kiss? Um, you know, it's it's a little bit of everything, man. It's there's Kiss, there's everything from Kiss, Journey, Stevie Wonder, Aerosmith, Iron Maiden, Motley Crue, um, you know, and everything in between uh, up until, I mean, bands like them, Beatles, Jellyfish, All in Oats, um, you know, and then, I mean, 90s rock. I mean, so much stuff that goes into, I mean, once I start naming my influence, I'm like, man, I've been around a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did, uh, you ever t- did you ever take to those bands in the, the noughties, we'll say, the likes of the new metal bands, did they do anything for you or did you appreciate that type of music or was it just kind of, a lot of people say that they don't like that type of music, say guys like Lip Biscuit and, you know, Soil, Drown and Poo, people like that. Like, did you take any influence from those guys or was this not your thing? Well, I mean, I love that music, new metal and all the hard rock. Uh, there's the other band that I have mentioned that I'm in is a band called Ra. Yeah. And okay. that's very, that is very uh, kind of new metal vibes to it. Yeah. When that came out, when Ra came out, we were, you know, it was kind of a new metal kind of sound. Um, but it was definitely that kind of active rock radio, hard rock band. Um, and I love that stuff because even though I grew up in Kiss, Motley Crue, and uh, Bon Jovi, Aerosmith, all that stuff, I also, once the, the kind of heavy metal thrash scene came up and the Anthrax, Metallica, Slayer, and all that stuff, when that came in, I loved that stuff too. I mean, I, so I celebrated it all. I would, I would go see Bon Jovi and, you know, Slayer. Yeah, yeah. I would go to all of it, you know, and and love it all. So, I mean, uh, I'm a mixed bag, you know. I definitely have influences from everything. I love Bon Jovi. They're actually the first band I've ever seen. But, like, the last gig I was at was Slipknot. And then before that was Metallica. So I'd be kind of – anything that there's kind of good instruments involved in, like, I'll be a part of it. Like, once it's kind of rocky, you know. Yeah. And hey, you know what? If it's good, it's good. Yeah. You know. In terms of being on the road then with bands throughout the years, um, what's the favorite place you've ever went to? What's your favorite place you've ever played? As far as like city or country or like just just or- crowd and show, like really, what's the best gig you think you've come off stage and said that was fucking brilliant and that can't be topped? Um, you know, we had a couple on the warrant tour with trickster that yeah. were just amazing like 32 33,000 people just in midsummer outdoor venues at, um I, I don't know what it's called now it was the world amphitheater in chicago just sold out just a sea of people and the crowd was nuts um red rock amphitheater in denver colorado sold out with warrant um beautiful night you know, we went on, as, you know, as the sun was going down, it was, you know, if anybody ever wanted to play Red Rocks, that's how you do it. You know, sold out and you can go on like it, you know, eight o'clock. Is there, is there anywhere in the world that you, you want to gig that you haven't before? Um, I'd like to hit it all, man. I mean, there's so much that I have not done. You know, Trickster was really kind of handicapped back in the day because – we were so busy in the States, you know, we barely got to Japan. We went there once for two weeks. Um, yeah. We didn't go to Europe. We, we didn't go to Europe or the UK until a couple of years ago. And that was for, you know, one or two shows. It wasn't much. So I did get to go to Europe and stuff with when I was playing with Lita Ford. Um, so I got like that whole European festival experience which was amazing. Um, I'd like to do all that again. And um, Australia, I haven't been to yet. I know that Fozzie's working on some Australian dates, so that'd be amazing. Love to do that. Um, anytime we get to go to Japan is amazing. I love it there. Um, I've been to Italy a couple times, but I never, I never got to spend much time there. Every time I've been there, it's like almost like a hit and run. 
know, I, and I've only been to Milan like three times. Um, so I'd like to see a little bit more of that. Um, yeah, I mean, that can go on for days. Yeah. <laughs> A lot, a lot of people say when I ask them that question, they always say Japan because not a lot of bands venture from that far in the States over to Japan. And like, I've never been personally either, but a friend of mine actually goes on holidays there. He's went on holidays twice by himself just to go over there. And he just says, it's an amazing place. I go over, go to concerts, go to orchestras, all that kind of thing. And it's very uh, respectful from the people over there. Like they're just big into music. Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely uh, it's different in the sense that you know when you go over there, like we'll be backstage and no one we're playing like a full house. You know, you just know the room is buzzing and you hear music pumping before you go on. And the crowd's buzzing and you can kind of feel that backstage. You know, every once in a while you go take a glimpse. You know, um, but in Japan, you don't know if there's you don't even know if the doors are open before you go on because there's nothing going on. You can hear a pin dropping like. We're on in five minutes. You peek out. The place is packed, but they're quiet and they're just waiting. And they can't wait. Yeah. Super excited, but they're just, you know, that's their deal. They're quiet. You come out, they go. Where is it? In, in Ireland, I don't know. Have you been to Ireland? No, and I can't wait to get there. Yeah. Because in Ireland, we, we're the opposite. We're allowed. We like to have a few beers, a lot of beers, and we like to just get amped up before someone comes on. I'm yeah. sure you'll probably you'll probably end up here with the the Fozzie guys anyway at some point. Uh, there is talk about it already, yeah, the UK and uh, Ireland and stuff like that. So, and look, my 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 last name is Farley, so yeah, well. that's 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 another thing I was going to say. PJ Farley for anyone that was would be looking at this and just see the caption, they'll probably think, oh, he's he's got an Irish guy on tonight. Well, who? Yeah, Irish and Italian. Yeah. Have you, have you got Irish influence? Yeah, background. Uh very good. Do you know where in Ireland? Um, I don't actually. I, I I don't know. I got to do one of those, you know, those tree tests or, you know, what is it called? Yeah. Family tree test, I think, yeah. or something like that. And another question I always ask people about tour life is like, because it's so it can be so random and funny. It's like, what's the funniest thing you've ever seen when you're on tour? Just the funniest random story you have. I'm sure there's millions, but you gotta pick one that's not too bad. Um, one that always comes to mind is people always ask, "What was the weirdest thing somebody's ever asked you to sign?" Or when it comes to giving an autograph. Yeah. <laughs> Remember years ago, we were in Trickster was doing a show in Long Island at a club, and we went across the street to go eat dinner, and I had to go in the bathroom. So I excused myself, went to the bathroom, and then I hear the door open, and I hear, uh, excuse me, PJ, I know you're taking a shit, but could you sign this? And over comes a piece of paper with a pen, and, and I'm like, I, I look up, and I'm like, I'm, first I'm thinking, well, that's a really brave person. You don't know what I'm going to give you back, even if I say yes to doing it. But so, <laughs> secondly, I'm, I'm thinking – Thanks to my band members who are going, here you go. Yeah, yeah, here, go get PJs in the bathroom. You know, and the guy's like, yeah, why wait till he comes out? Let's go bother him right now. <laughs> so, uh, you got to give it to him. So, uh, and lucky for him, luckily for him, I gave him back just his piece of paper. Yeah, you didn't take a wipe before you handed it back. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you end up uh, getting into Fozzie? Um, well, Chris and I have been friends for many years and we've been, we did, you know, we started doing this quarantine project, yeah. uh, which is just to sum it up. It's a eighties kiss tribute band kind of where we do just Bruce Kulick era kiss covers. And, um, it started over the pandemic. And so the whole pandemic started and Fozzie had some, some touring that they needed to do and, uh, their bass player was just not really comfortable going out and touring. And um, like he didn't want to do anything. So um, Chris and Rich called me. It really is yeah. simple as that. You know, kind of like, all right, well, we got we got these shows and we got to do them. So. But how did they go for you? What's that? How did the shows go? Awesome. I mean, yeah. it was like second nature. It was just 
like I for both parts, it, it felt like I was there for a long time already. I mean, obviously me and Chris have a history, but even with the rest of the guys in the band, the crew, I got on that bus without knowing a bunch of them. And it was just really easy, fun on and off stage. Yeah, I had Billy on the podcast a couple of months ago and he was uh, kind enough to come on. He's a nice guy as well. I I met Billy. I th- I've met Billy and I've met I've met Chris at a he done a meet and greet kind of a wrestling thing in Dublin before and I met Chris. It was only kind of a short kind of autograph and thing, but like he was a cool guy. But a funny story about Chris is I I met him and I think it was paid a hundred euro, I think it was, to go meet Jericho and have the show and like that was that was a bargain you know and we went to the pub afterwards and we were having a few drinks and I said listen guys I gotta go home because I have to work in the morning so I left and my six friends were there behind me and by 10 minutes after I left Chris came into the pub and hung out with the guys for the night (laughs) and there I I was like I paid this hundred euro to go meet Chris and everything and the guys didn't go and then after the show they, they were just hanging out with Chris for the night talking about Metallica and wrestling well, I, and all that I, kind of thing i'll tell you, you you at least you got to meet him and yeah. you didn't have to spend the entire night in the pub with him your liver yeah. probably thanks you and you got more sleep than everyone else that night of that yeah <clears throat> he came in and he was uh, i think straight for the gray goose yeah yeah, yeah. He, Irish he was lucky. give me the goose yeah. Yeah, he was lucky the establishment that we were in actually had Grey Goose because, you know, with rock bars and it's it wasn't a guarantee, but he, he got his drinks anyway, and that's the main yeah. thing. <laughs> Where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. But the uh, the guys, like, often come to Dublin, like, and they've had some great shows over here, so I, I would definitely expect to see you here at some point. And yeah. in terms of quarantine then with Chris and the rest of the guys, like, have you got more stuff lined up ready to come out? Um, we are, we have our next song selected. We haven't started it yet, but it's selected. And are you guys recording that remotely, like away from each other? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't it crazy how far technology has come to be able to do something like that? Yeah. I mean, you know, Chris loves telling the story, but I mean, we, we put out these songs and these videos and, and the first one we did, no, 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 went to number 25 on the rock chart. and. Chris and I hadn't even had never even met Joe, the guitar player. I had never met Kent, the drummer, either in person. So I mean, me and Chris knew each other, but and Chris knew Kent, but I had never met Chris or Kent. Never and what's the-, in the same room until we filmed the video for Love's Deadly Weapon? And um, what's the process of doing that then? What do you do first? Is it like bass and drums or? guitar or what ways it work with something like that um it depends i mean i think actually did kent do no 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 the drum track for i think kent did the drum track to no 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 without anything just like no track just from memory so and then joe did the guitar track and i did the bass and then uh for the rest of them i think joe did like a, a scratch guitar track and then kent did the drums and then they send that to me, and then Chris goes on last. Yeah, like it, it's a crazy time though for the music industry, and a lot of people doing that kind of online thing. Right. What's what's the music industry, and from terms of a gig standpoint, where you're living now? Um, uh, starting to open up a little bit. Yeah, so I had a few gigs. Yeah, yeah, I, I I leave this week and um. I play with Eric Martin from Mr. Big and me and him have a couple of acoustic shows. We go out and do these kind of smaller acoustic gigs where it's actually kind of custom fit for a uh, sit down kind of yeah. social distant thing. But um, we do full capacity shows prior to the pandemic. And uh, so we go back. I mean, we're pretty busy this month and next month and we have shows all through the summer and and then Fozzie picks up in the middle of July. We have a couple of festivals and a couple of one-offs and then the beginning of uh, September, I think September 2nd is the first show and we're out, we're out for a good month and a half. 
And um, so, you know, it's kind of like as of this week, things are kind of returning back to somewhat of normal pace for me, where, you know, I'm going to be at the, air, at, at the airport every week and, you know, back back to the frequent flyer mile club and, um, you know, getting out and playing, traveling, doing what I do finally, you know. Do you miss the traveling and just being on the road in general? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been doing it all my life, literally. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like um, – Although last year I I did need the break as it, as it turns out I realized because if you had told me all right you're gonna take a year off and I didn't take a year off I shouldn't say that I took five yeah. months where I didn't do anything even if you told me you're gonna take five months off I'd be like you're crazy I can't do it like I'm not that's not in my DNA can't you know gather any moss um, plus I'd, I'd go like stir crazy. But uh, I had a pretty easy time with that five months. I was like, you know what? I got a lot done at the house. You know, I was home. We spent the summer at home with my family. And uh, it was re- it didn't bother me at all. So that just showed me that I really – I got a lot of sleep last year. More <laughs> sleep, like more sleep than I ever needed. And to the point to where I was like, all right, I, I got to get off this seven, eight hour a night sleep. Thing. This is this is making me even more tired. You know, I, I function better on less sleep. Um, and after five months, you know, I started up with Fozzie and then back with Eric. So it wasn't as hectic as it normally was, but at least I was doing something. Um, but you know, looks like I'm back at it now. I've got some good news and some bad news. What's that? It's probably the longest break you'll get for the rest of your career, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. I, mean, I think, you know, in terms of music as well, like um, with the way it's gone with, there's no money like really in records now anymore. Like, so bands and musicians have to be on the road. Like, and I think a lot of bands that weren't on the, say, elite tier of musicians making music really, really suffered throughout the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, unless you were grandfathered in, sort of, you know, I mean, I mean, really, all musicians make their money on the road. I mean, yeah. no one makes money selling records anymore, really. They're just not, you know. And anyone who's still making new music and putting it out is, you know, really doing it for the love of music, um, especially those who don't really need to put out records anymore. And they're still doing it. It's like, you know, it's costing us money to do it because we're not seeing it return. You know, we do it because we love to create. Um, but yeah, I mean, we love to get out and then bring that new music to people and hear how it's reacting, you know, play it live, and get out and do what we do and connect. Do you think it's a good time to be recording your own music? Because we talked earlier about the, the way you guys can make music over the internet. Do you think now it's a good time for bands to be putting out music because they don't need to spend like years ago, probably like hundreds of thousands to make a proper record? Like, you know, if you know the right people and you have the right gear, you can nearly do it yourself. Do you find that? I mean, yeah, there's no question about it. I mean, anyone could make a record in their house now. I mean, if if you if you have the right gear and knowledge and patience, um, anyone can make a record just as good as any record that's coming out now. Um, that being said, a lot of people who think that they can and they can't. Yeah. Um, so that's a problem too. I mean, just because you can have a studio doesn't mean you can run it and use it properly. Yeah. And there's something to be said about getting in a room with a band and a producer and an engineer and just knowing that you're on, you're kind of on a, clock and a schedule and spending money and a little bit of pressure. There's something to be said for that. That's where I came from, you know, where it was like, all right, we got a studio locked out for a month and, you know, get that shit done, you know. And uh, it just really makes you get hyper-focused. Whereas if you have a studio and you're at your house, it's really easy to get distracted and 
overthink things and never finish it and um, just perfect it. So there's, there's definitely pluses and definitely minuses to it, you know, but I would say the pluses outweigh the minuses. Yeah. I, I enjoyed you guys with Fozzy doing the studio show there before Christmas. Um, where yeah, it was that was just, fun. Yeah, where it was just you guys in the studio, kind of like um, an in-your-house kind of concert kind of thing, you know? But it, yeah. came across, it came across really well, I think, because he didn't just play the music, like he had a few stories, you were involved telling stories, it was yeah. interactive, and you guys like just seemed to be having fun there. Yeah, it was funny because... Um, and, you know, poor Frank, I felt bad for him because, you know, we're out there, we come out and just, you know, doing our thing, right? Yeah. He can ask. And then we stop for 10 minutes and talk, you know, and, you know, Frank's got to get out there, you know, kick some ass and drums and, you know, you take a break and then you got to, boom, get right back into it. It's like, I felt bad for him. We were having a great time playing and talking and stuff, but we're used to, you know, once you, uh, once you hit the green light, you know, we're going. And we're not used yeah. to stopping, you know, it's all guns and blazing. So uh, that was the only weird part about it was, you know, <laughs> kind of getting that catch your breath and then having the fire back up. But so, it was so, great. So, so how long did it take to record that, say, 70 not minutes? Long. Not not long at all. I mean, we we did the set twice. Was it? Okay. Yeah. Really good. Right. Yeah. For yourself, for yourself, then, in terms of with Fozzy, with your own personal stuff going on, what can we expect in the future from you? Um, well, I have a new video coming out pretty soon, um, which will be on my YouTube channel and uh, my social media. And uh, I'm not sure the date, it's not quite finished yet, but um, within the next couple of weeks. So I would say maybe the middle of April, middle month, mid, well, we're in the sixth array, so mid yeah. to late month. Um, and I think we have a new sing uh, single coming out with Ra soon because we just put a new record out two weeks ago, I think, two or three weeks ago. Um, and um, I haven't heard a date yet, but I think Fozzy singles should be getting put on a schedule pretty soon. Yeah. So, you know, kind of firing on all cylinders now. It's going to kind of be uh, definitely uh, you're going to be running back into music anyway, hopefully. Yeah, playing, doing a little catch up. Yeah. You know, it's fine. I like it. You know, I love, you know, I'm very lucky and blessed to be able to play with such great bands and people and have a genuinely a great time with people that I really enjoy playing music that I enjoy. So I am, you know, I count my blessings every day, you know. It was great to catch up with you, and hopefully I'll see you in Ireland with the rest of the lads. Absolutely. Like I said, I'm here in Rumbling, so I hope to be over there with you. And I'll yeah, be here first. The pub. You'll be at the pub afterwards with Chris. Yeah, don't leave early. I'll be there. Okay, cool. Chris will definitely be there. <laughs> Thanks a million, man, for your time. All right, man. I appreciate yes. it. Uh, thanks for talking. Thanks, man. All right, man.